calling this hearing to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. This afternoon, we are here to explore the mental health coverage, supports, and services offered by the City of New York to its approximately 1.25 million public employees, retirees, and their dependents. We will also be hearing two pieces of legislation, introduction number 64, sponsored by Majority Leader Laurie Cumbo, in relation to creating a mental health coordinator to inform city employees about mental health support and services, and introduction number 1792, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, in relation to providing information relating to behavioral health services. In New York State and in New York City, all terms and conditions of a public employee's employment, including Healthcare benefits must be the result of a, negotiation, of a negotiation process referred to as collective bargaining. Through collective bargaining, the city offers three main insurance plans and low cost for basic coverage. Group health insurance, which merged with Emblem, comprehensive uh, benefits plan. GHI, uh, well, sorry, let me go back. Group health insurance, which is merged with Emblem. Comprehensive benefits plan, which is uh, also known as GHI CBP. Health Insurance Program of New York, which is also known as HIP HMO, and most recently, Metro Plus Gold. As of 2017, 96% of employees were enrolled in GHI, CBP, HIP, or Metro Plus Gold. All of these health plans include mental health care coverage. Due to both federal and state and states' mental health parity laws, New York group health plans must provide broad-based mental health coverage that is equivalent to surgical and medical coverage. There has been some criticism of the mental health care coverage for city employees, including concerns surrounding inadequate number of participating members, lack of competitive rates paid to mental health providers, high premiums paid by city, lack of meeting federal, state parity laws, co-pays and deductibles that are too high, wait times for care that are too long, a lack of information provided to city employees about mental health care options and stigma in receiving care within certain city agencies. As just some examples of these criticisms, a mental health care provider is paid $40 by GHI for one session of outpatient therapy and $15 in copay by, patient, by the patient for a total of $55 for a session of outpatient therapy. By contrast, the median fee for New York City-based mental health care provider is $220 per session. It seems obvious that, there is ex this, that this extreme low rate paid by GHI would lead to difficulty in recruiting and retaining a broad, culturally competent and diverse network of talented mental health care pro um, providers to participate in network. As another criticism, last year, following the tragic string of suicides within the New York City Police Department, Chief of Department Terrence Monaghan admitted that GHI makes it, tough, makes it tough for cops to seek mental health care, citing several providers having dropped out of GHI due to low and non-competitive reimbursement rates. We need to understand these criticisms and problems, and we need to do better for the hardworking employees of this city. This hearing will allow the committee to examine the crucial role that seamless and easy access to quality mental health insurance plays in providing necessary services for city employees and their families in a timely manner. I want to thank the representatives from the Office of Labor Relations and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene who are here today for their commitment to ensuring that quality mental health services are available for all New York City employees. And I look forward to hearing about what is being done to ensure that those services are delivered when and where they are needed and the role that the City Council can play in supporting those efforts. I also want to thank my colleagues as well as my committee senior staff, Council Sarah Liss, Policy Analyst Christy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, my Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director Bianca Almedina, and Chief of Staff Luisa Lopez for making this hearing possible. Um, I also want to thank the NYPD who is here today. Um, we, will, I don't, we, will, we will probably be joined by Majority Leader Cumbo um, in a little while, but I guess that we can then swear in the first panel. And this is for anyone who's going to be answering questions as well, so please all raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You can begin. Thank you, Chair Ayala, and members of the Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction Committee for inviting me here today to testify on this important issue 
for New York City employees and for all employees and employers. I'm Renee Campion, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Labor Relations, known as OLR. I have with me Kevin Bulger, who is Executive Director of the New York City Employee Assistance Program, or EAP, and Claire Levitt, OLR's Deputy Commissioner for Healthcare Strategy. Before I begin my testimony, I'd like first to acknowledge the recent deaths of two of our NYP officers last week and to extend on behalf of OLR my sincere sympathies to their families and to the entire NYPD community. These tragedies underscore the importance of ensuring our city employees and all New Yorkers have access to quality mental health care. By way of background, OLR is responsible for labor relations and negotiations between the City of New York and the many unions represented employees of the city. As part of that responsibility, OLR administers the health benefits programs for city employees and the employee assistance program, thus having oversight of many of the mental health programs available to the 1.2 million employees, dependents, and retirees covered by the City of New York. The common stressors of everyday life, like managing debt, dealing with the loss of a loved one, and dealing with physical illness, can impact our mental well-being and our ability to be present where we work. Stress and mental disorders can also exacerbate acute and chronic health conditions. Health conditions. In addition, we know from a Milliman research report that in individuals treated for mental health conditions typically incur two to three times as much health care cost as those without a mental health condition, further adding to their burden. Unfortunately, while mental health conditions are extremely common, they often remain hidden due to the stigma associated with them. Fortunately for our employees and their families, as well as our retirees, the City of New York provides many opportunities for the treatment of mental health issues, including extensive health insurance options at no cost, a wide range of employee assistance programs sponsored by the City and its municipal unions, and WorkWell NYC, our worksite wellness program. All New York City employees, dependents, and retirees enjoy the unique privilege of having extremely generous health insurance coverage options available available to them from the city for free. That is, no employee contribution to the premium cost for either individual or family coverage. The majority of New York City employees, 75%, choose to be in the emblem GHI CBP Comprehensive Benefit Program PPO plan, while approximately 20% are in emblems HIP HMO plan. Both of these plans, which are chosen by 95% of our city employees, are premium free to employees and dependents. The remaining 5% of employees choose from several different available options, some of which require an employee premium share. Retirees also have free health coverage options. New York City's premium free coverage is a stark contrast to the average employee in the United States, who contributes over $1,200 a year and over for individual coverage and over $6,000 a year for the premium for family coverage. New York City employees with the CBP or HIP HMO have no annual deductible on their plans, which means there are no out-of-pocket costs before the insurance coverage starts paying for services. Most employer plans, by contrast, have an annual deductible, which is on average over $1,600. All of our health insurance plans include extensive coverage for mental health treatment and cover all mental health and substance use treatment, including hospital admissions, partial hospitalization programs, rehabilitation facilities, outpatient visits to psychologists, adult and child psychiatrists, and clinical social workers for ongoing support. The mental health network for the GHI CBP plan and the HIP HMO plan are both administered by Beacon Health on behalf of Emblem Health. In both the GHI and HIP plans, in addition to having no premium cost sharing and no deductible, the co-pays for each visit to in-network mental health providers are exceptionally low. While the average plan in the country is reported by Kaiser to have office visit copays of $25 for primary care and $40 for specialty care, for New York City employees in the GHI plan, copays for primary care and mental health care are only $15. And the HIP HMO, they are either $0 for preferred doctors or $10 for non preferred doctors. For inpatient mental health, the copays are also minimal. For the HIP HMO, there's a $100 copay per admission. For GHI, it's a $300 copay for admission, up to a $750 maximum per calendar year. 
Both plans provide coverage for substance use disorders for the same co-pays as that of mental health. The GHI plan also allows employees the flexibility to utilize out-of-network providers subject to additional coverages, uh, deductibles, and co-pays with cost-sharing options to cover services. Emblem Health has reported to us that in 2019, over 83,000 New York City employees and their dependents generated 1.4 million visits to mental health providers. About 23% of those visits were to psychiatrists, 19 to psychologists, 39% to clinical social workers, and the balance to other providers. About 75% of the GHI visits were to in-network professionals. Currently, the HIP HMO network has approximately 8,200 behavioral health providers in the 12 downstate counties. The GHI network has approximately 6,800 providers in the 12 downstate counties. While this is a very substantial number of providers, we do recognize that the increasing demand for mental health services can make it challenging to find mental health professionals, especially those with convenient hours for working people. In New York City and in many areas, it can also be difficult to find mental health professionals willing to take any insurance coverage. The shortage of mental health professionals is especially severe for psychiatrists. Access to mental health professionals is a widely recognized problem, not just in New York City, but across the nation. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, about 111 million people in the U.S. live in designated mental health professional shortage areas, some of which are in New York City. To address access concerns for city employees, the city has been exploring solutions with Emblem Health, Beacon Health, and the Municipal Labor Committee to expand the mental health provider network, as well as to introduce a more convenient way for city employees in GHI to access the, serv to access the services of mental health providers. The MLC Executive Board is now recommending the city's proposed expansion of the mental health network to the MLC membership. First, Emblem estimates that it may be possible to add as many 1,000 new providers to the GHI network within the next four to six months, increasing the availability of in-network providers by about 15%. This is an important step in continuing to ensure that all city employees have appropriate access to necessary mental health services. Second, a telemedicine benefit has been recommended for behavioral health care for GHI members that will provide access to mental health professionals telephonically and through video like FaceTime or Skype. This will mean that city employees in GHI will be able to access a mental health professional from the privacy of their home or any other convenient location without requiring them to go to an office location. Similar to our telemedicine benefit for medical treatment, which has generated high utilization and strong customer satisfaction among the city's workforce, we hope that telemedicine can encourage more people to seek care due to the convenience and the privacy. These services could be available from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily, seven days a week, providing access during the much needed after work and weekend hours that are particularly necessary based on our dedicated city employees' work schedules. On a personal note, I'd just like to share that I personally have used the, tele, uh, the telemedicine benefit for, for physical issue. I was actually in Colorado uh, about a year ago with visiting my sister and her two, and her two, two daughters, um, and I realized very quickly that I was going to need, need an antibiotic. So I called up Teladoc, which is our vendor for telemedicine, called up after, as part of a 20 to maybe 25 minute maximum interaction with that person, with the physician who was actually located in Colorado because uh, where you call from, you need to be in the same state. That professional that's talking to you needs to be from the same state certified. Um, I was able to access uh, an antibiotic. He was able to call up. I was at the local Walgreens at down, down the block a mile or so from my sister's house pick it up and my weekend was continued with no interruption um, of, of the fun uh, that we were having that weekend. So I really um, can appreciate that. EAP, starting in the late 60s and continuing to present day, New York City has a rich history of providing EAP programs to our employees and their family members. Currently, New York City has an extensive network of agency and union-based EAPs providing services to all city employees. Each EAP offers distinct services based on employees' needs, but all the programs work in concert with one another to best serve all New York City employees. EAPs follow all 
policies and procedures of the Mayor's Executive Order Number 46 that was signed off on by Mayor David Dinkins. The New York City Employee Assistance Program, the largest of all city EAPs, is under the auspices of the Office for Labor Relations. I am very proud of this. Currently, the New York City EAP provides services to mayoral agencies, the Housing Authority, New York City Health and Hospitals, and the Department of Education. The New York City EAP is designed to assist employees and their families in resolving personal problems that may be adversely affecting their personal and professional performance. New York City EAP offers assistance with a broad range of behavioral health issues, such as substance abuse and misuse, mental health, child or elder care, relationship challenges, financial or legal problems, bereavement, wellness matters, and traumatic events such as workplace violence. Free individual and family services are offered in person via phone and or email interactions. Other services provided by the New York City EAP include information and referral services, case management, and extensive follow-up and insurance authorization. And in 2018, the New York City EAP worked along with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to register the EAP as an opiate overdose prevention program, offering all EAP clients the opportunity to be supplied with naloxone and trained to administer it if exposed to an overdose. The overdose prevention program and all EAP services are free and confidential, and all services are provided by master's level mental health professionals. New York City EAP also offers supervisors and manager trainings and cons consultations to aid in their response to staff members' behavioral health needs, stress management, suicide awareness and prevention, de-escalation techniques, improving communication in the workplace are just a few of the presentations offered to our employees. Supervisory consultations, on-site workshops, and staff presentations are provided upon the request of any city agency. In regards to supervisors that may need assistance with addressing an employee's behavioral health issue, the New York City EAP offers guidance through a multi-step model that emphasizes privacy, empathy, and the steps to take to direct the employees to EAP for further assistance and support. Furthermore, New York City EAP provides agency on-site interventions based on need and by request of the agency. Most often, the New York City EAP is requested when a traumatic event has occurred at a work site, such as a threat to an employee's safety, unexpected loss of a coworker, or other crisis-related events. At times of crisis events, the EAP has adapted to the needs of New York City employees and the agencies. For example, in 2014, at the Department of Environmental Protection, there was a murder that took place at one of the upstate facilities. That was extremely traumatic for the employees at that site. The EAP, representatives of the EAP, offered ongoing support and services to the facility, which then inspired DEP to create and support an additional EAP counselor that could offer the EAP services to their more remote locations. And I'm here to say that our EAP staff members still visit those upstate locations to this day. In general, New York City's EAP delivery of services to clients emphasizes accessibility, confidentiality, and appropriateness of clinical and social service treatment plans. Services to individual employees, supervisors, or agencies are completely confidential, free, and voluntary. The expertise of the EMA, EAP counselors, all of whom are master level mental health professionals, assist employees and their family members to address a wide range of personal problems. On average, over 62% of individuals accessing EAP identify mental health problems as their reason for reaching out to the program. In addition to mental health problems, 42% of those who contact EAP also identify family problems, and 33% note job-related problems. EAP services continue to grow based on an increasing need and request for services. In 2018, EAP documented roughly 7,000 individuals that accessed a service of EAP. In 2019, there was an increase of approximately 50%, with over 10,000 individuals reached by EAP services. These services include direct clinical services to individuals and family members, supervisor consultations, as well as on-site services such as workshops, presentations, health fairs, and trauma interventions. Requests for these on-site services have increased by 47% from 2018 to 19, indicating the growing need of mental health support services in the workplace. Based on the increase in demand for EAP services, the program is also planning to expand our program in the following ways. 
adopt an online platform that will allow New York City employees and their families to access the program confidentially via text or video, therefore increasing accessibility and convenience for those who need assistance. Acquiring an advanced electronic service record database to document all EAP services in order to elevate quality of care by decreasing administrative barriers to productivity and clinical work. This system will also allow the EAP to track quantitative and qualitative data in order to capture and analyze outcomes, productivity levels, recognize trends, and potential needs of our pop city population. Incorporating the Workplace Outcome Suite, which will offer EAP information on absenteeism, presenteeism, work engagement, workplace distress, and life satisfaction among our EAP clients. Assessing these particular domains will offer the EAP an even greater opportunity to enhance New York City's employees' well-being and assist in the strength and resilience of our New York City workforce. New York City EAP continues to deepen services by developing programs, new programs, tailored for city employees with specific needs. Last year, the EAP was contacted by the Administration for Children's Services Division of Child Protection to develop the first New York City DCP-specific EAP program. Child Protective Specialists are first responders for New York City's children. They work around the clock to make sure that children are safe and families receive services they need in order to stay together and be healthy. Working as a CSP CPS worker is rewarding, however, it can put many CPS employees at the risk for compassion fatigue. Staff within the Division of Child Protection now have access to on-site mental health counselors throughout the New York City's EAP. DCP's EAP Mental health counselors are located at ACS work sites and provide a wide range of services to address concerns such as depression, anxiety, secondary trauma, substance misuse, family issues, intimate partner violence, bereavement, conflicts with coworkers, job stress, and more. And before I leave the, my, my testimony on the EAP program, I'd like to just say two on two personal notes. As an agency head of the Office of Labor Relations, I mentioned that how proud I am of our EAP staff. They do amazing work every single day, and they help city employees uh, help themselves change their lives every single day. I've per personally witnessed my, some members in my own agency over the years who have um, gone to voluntarily gone to EAP, and I have seen those same, I've seen those people to this day, they continue to be in my agency, they continue to work for our agency, and they are thriving, and I have seen that myself. On a separate, very personal note, I myself have used the EAP services several years ago. Um, and I'd, I'd like to say that the support and the resource that the EAP counselors gave to me and were able to have me access personal um, resources uh, through our health insurance plan um, and to allow me to be to, to sort of over the course of time be able to put myself in a position where I was able to advance at that time I was the first deputy commissioner of the office of labor relations and today I sit in front of you as the commissioner of labor relations and I will honestly tell you that without that support from our employees EAP program I don't know that I could be here testifying to you today so I really, really am a person who really stands out and wants to uh, um, um, cheer our EAP program. And I talk to people about it all the time because I know personally it's helped me and it's helped people that I've worked with. Recently, the OLR's New York City EAP program joined with the Department of Education, and this was just announced this past Friday. We're super excited about this. On Friday, two, February 21st, the UFT along with the DC-37 Personnel Unit um, and the Department of Education and New York City's EAP expanded services to all DOE employees and their families. Now the New York City EAP will deliver comprehensive services to help DOE employees overcome personal problems that diminish quality of life and interfere with effectiveness on the job, as well as trauma interventions in the event of critical job-related incidents. As provided for all New York City employees, the EAP will offer DOE employees the same mental health assessments and referral assistance to connect them to the appropriate resources in the community or through their health insurance plans. DOE will also be offered customized management training programs to guide supervisors and managers to effectively use the EAP as a tool for addressing performance problems and other supervisory concerns. WorkWell NYC. Is, New York, is OLR's workplace wellness program for our 380,000 New York City employees. As part of this administration's commitment to our employees, 
WorkWell NYC was created in only 2016 to leverage the convenience of the workplace to promote health and well-being, boost workforce engagement, and attract well-qualified candidates to civil service. Worksite wellness, pro wellness programs result in numerous benefits for employees, employers, and the public, including improved employee physical and mental health, reduced health care costs, and improved productivity. WorkWell NYC offers convenient, accessible programs, tools, and resources in four key areas. Eat well, healthy eating, move more, physical activity, take action, primary care and prevention, and be well, our mental well-being and resilience program. We recognize the importance of addressing the needs of the whole employee and therefore addressing both physical and emotional mental health. As part of our outreach to our employees, WorkWell NYC sends monthly email blasts to our over 380,000 city employees providing health and well-being information and resources. Every e-blast includes a call to action, whether to participate in a program, to download a tool, or a link to get more information. Let me turn now to the NYPD and our newest service. I also want to highlight Finest Care, a partnership between the NYPD and New York Presbyterian Hospital, which provides access to 24-hour telephone-based counseling service, services, comprehensive evaluation and mental health assessments, medication management and psychotherapy services, and counseling referral services for all uniformed members of the service confidentially and at no cost. Lastly, all captains and above in the police department, as well as all civilian executives in the department, have taken the executive health and wellness training program to better assist those in leadership roles, to recognize those in crisis, and to provide support and resources. Our office also partners with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC to support the mental health of city employees. Through Thrive NYC, nearly 68,000 city employees have been trained in mental health first aid which is a Thrive NYC supported program implemented by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Mental Health First Aid is an evidence-driven, free, eight-hour training that is regularly provided seven days a week in all five boroughs to expand the number of people who can help New Yorkers in need. Conducted regularly in English, Mandarin, and Spanish, Mental Health First Aid helps trainees recognize mental health needs, learn how to talk about them, and learn where to direct people in need to ongoing care. In 2019, we partnered with Thrive NYC to launch the Be Well program under OLR's Work Well New York City initiative. Be Well offers programs and resources to promote mental health among the almost 400,000 people employed by the City of New York. This program aims to create work environments that support the mental and emotional well-being of city employees and create opportunities for employees to build resilience. Our program helps to promote our EAP, New York City Well, and the Mental Health First Aid Training. Lastly, I will now turn to the legislation being heard today, Intro 64 by Council Member Cumbo, to would mandate that each city agency identify a mental health coordinator to assist and perform outreach to employees of the city about mental health services and support services, including but not limited to the EAPs. OLR supports this bill, shares the Council's interest in promoting a, men a mentally and physically healthier workforce. We'd also like to note that WorkWell currently has a network of hundreds of ambassadors and champions located at virtually all city agencies who share information and promote and implement WorkWell and other worksite programming. The roles of ambassadors and champions are critical in increasing the physical and mental wellness of New York City employees and enhancing the culture of wellness at our worksites. We would like to discuss opportunities for city agencies to further engage even more staff in wellness programming, provide deeper communication about resources, and access staff across all locations. Finally, Intro 1792 by Councilmember Torres, which requires the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop a list of all free behavioral health services and share the information with city agencies that provide direct services to young adults, family, and children. DOHMH supports the intent of this legislation. If you have additional questions, I will let Dr. Myla Harrison from the Health Department speak to the specifics of that bill. I'd like to conclude by saying that OLR, on behalf of the de Blasio administration, recognizes and takes very seriously the importance of caring for the mental health of our employees and their families. Through our extensive health insurance program coverage, our EAP programs, and our worksite wellness programs, we offer a comprehensive approach to addressing those needs. 
We're also working on new and innovative approaches as evidenced by the discussions on expanding the mental health network and a new telemedicine benefit for mental health, the expansion of EAP programming, and the growing impact of our worksite wellness programs. Thank you again for your time, and now I'd be pleased to take your questions. Thank you. I can't see and lost where I wrote really nice and big who was here. Um, so we want to acknowledge Council Member Van Bramer, who was here, Council, um, Majority Leader Cumbo, Council Member Cabrera, and Council Member Ambry Samuels. We'll now turn it over to uh, Deputy Majority Leader uh, Lori Cumbo for remarks. Thank you, Chair Ayala, and I thank you so much for um, expediting this hearing and for prioritizing this very important issue. Um, I want to uh, begin by thanking you also for your enthusiasm as well. Um, intro 64-2018 will require that every city agency have a mental health coordinator. Today we will hear from advocates, civilians, and organizations that have worked tirelessly to bring forth mental health legislation protecting our city agency employees. Of the many advocates represented today, I want to highlight Ms. Beverly Johnson, who will share her experiences battling mental health challenges and the insurance system. From day one, she has helped champion this cause and has worked closely with our office to effect positive change. It is thanks to her that we are having this hearing today. In an age where increased awareness and conversations about health and wellness are coming to the forefront, I thank Beverly and the countless others whose courage, tenacity, and determination brought this issue to the forefront. So as we are here in Black History Month, you are making history, Ms. Beverly Johnson, and you're sliding right into Women's History Month with a renewed excitement and just bringing so much to the council at a very important time of recognition of African Americans and of women, and you are certainly a trailblazer um, in your persistence and your dedication and your many, 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 many visits to my office, <laughs> as well as phone calls have certainly paid off. So we certainly salute you as one of our sheroes for this Black History Month, as well as our Women's Herstory Month. We hear so much in the media about health and wellness and self-care, the overall importance of taking care of our entire being, from our physical health down to our emotional, mental, psychological, and spiritual health. It is imperative that a city who prides itself on diversity and tolerance, that we be vigilant, but most importantly, intentional in meeting the needs of our city's employees, who are inundated with stressful, high impact, and even traumatic situations daily. Mental health continues to be left out of the conversation for many communities of color due to cultural biases, lack of access education, and inadequate health care coverage. This bill will not only help to support so many of our city workers, but continue to push back on the stigma surrounding mental health. As Inspector General an Inspector General survey related that a sampling of NYPD officers perceived stigma associated with seeking mental health services within their department. Officers have also voiced concern over GHI's inadequacy in reimbursing mental health claims. Having a dedicated coordinator to provide information on services, both free and paid, may provide greater access to care for these personnel. I want to again thank Chair Ayala for your leadership. I want to thank Beverly Johnson, Kevin and and Christian at Heights Hill Mental Health, Carmen Collado of the Shield Institute, formerly at ICL Women's Shelter, and Fiadna O'Grady at Samaritans NYC. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have a whole bunch of questions for you guys today. Um, I guess I will start here. So for individuals that are seeking therapy, how long does it usually take um, to schedule an appointment. So I would like to, to uh, refer to my Deputy Commissioner for Healthcare Strategy, Claire Levitt, to re provide that response. Okay. Thank you for that very important question. Um, we know that it's crucial that patients are able to access care in a timely manner, and we do believe that there is 
availability for new patients to find providers in the network. But one of the difficulties we do think that patients encounter is that employees are often looking for treatment after hours, um, after their work hours, and those are most in demand and they are harder to find. Um, We've spoken with Beacon Health and they've advised us that the length of time that individuals wait for an appointment depends on their immediate need. Um, normally what happens is if you call, you get an assessment, uh, an assessment, and in the case of a true emergency, members are seen immediately or referred to an emergency facility. In an emergent situation, um, they've advised us that members are normally seen within six hours. In an urgent situation, within 48 hours. But in routine situations, it can take up to 10 business days. Um, at, in order to get an appointment. And again, I think it, it depends on how specific the type of appointment is. If you are, if you're looking for an appointment with a specific um, type of provider in a very specific location with very specific hours, it can take longer to find that provider. In cases where there's an emergency, are patients then referred to, or employees referred to the emergency room at any time? Sometimes the employees are referred to the emergency room. That can be the best place to go if it is truly an, if it is truly an emergency. They may be, um, they may be referred to um, uh, to the EAP program. They may be referred um, to called NYC Well. There are a lot of different avenues for getting emergency treatment. Is someone collecting data that would better advise as to how many people were referred to the EAP, to the emergency room, or to a provider? Um, data is being collected by, by Emblem and Beacon Health on where people are being referred. Um, I don't think we've seen um, outcomes data on that, and that's certainly something we can request that they give us. Yeah, I would, I would appreciate that. And, and also on the EAP program, perhaps Kevin Bulger, the director of EAP, could speak more on the, on the emergency status. I think I got it on. Yep. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I think when we're talking about emergency, we really most um, psychiatric emergencies do go through 911 uh, to an emergency room. That's how most people get into inpatient uh, because it's a severe uh, psychiatric issue. But we do get uh, agencies calling us for critical incident on the job where a person might be uh, expressing some type of uh, concern that the agency has. Um, then we respond with our, our uh, counselors to uh, work with the employee and decide the best level of care. Um, someone expressing maybe suicidal ideations. But the majority of people through, say, Beacon, when they go to a hospital, it's because it's usually off hours and there's some really psychiatric emergency that Beacon feels that hospitalization is needed at that time. Can you remind me again, what was the number of calls to the EAP program last year? Did you, did you, was that in the testimony? I don't remember hearing that. In 2018-19, how many yes. calls we received? Yes. Um, we serviced. I can tell you how many people we serviced. Uh, 2019 was 10, no, 2019 was 6,000, 7,000, and the uh, I'm sorry, 2018 was 6,000, and 2019 was 10,000. Okay. So let me just go back a little bit. So if I'm an employee and I remember having to go through this grueling process, like many of us, and I'm walking into HR. Um, for my onboarding appointment. I am really nervous. I'm freaking out a little bit. I'm hearing a lot of information that's really new to me, and I'm probably given a package probably as big as this one, if not bigger. <laughs> um, sure that somewhere in that process, somebody would have informed me about those services, the EAP services. However, I may not have heard what was being shared because I was really nervous. Um, how, how, how are employees then, how is the information getting to the employees? How are we making sure um, that the information is readily available without having to kind of force somebody to maybe self-disclose? Because my, my experience tells me that a lot of people usually go to their immediate supervisor when they're feeling like something is just really uh, off 
and it's and that something is maybe impacting their ability to do their job and as an attempt to maybe explain to the super immediate supervisor that there's something going on they may disclose that they are in fact going through a nervous breakdown um, suffering from some sort of chemical dependency issue how do we prevent that from happening and how do we ensure that the information is readily available in a way that an employee would not have to self-disclose to an, to an employer. Um, is that something that happens now? Okay, great. Thank you. That's a really terrific question. That's, that's uh, really great. Um, I'm happy to respond on, on the overall uh, uh, information, how we send out information to our city employees. So first up, for new employees or any employees, the OLR website nyc.gov slash OLR is an excellent source of information. It has specifically all of our um, employee benefit programs as well as our health insurance programs um, and a specific uh, section on the employee assistance program. So if people go there, they will be provided with additional information. There is EAP information, which Kevin will speak a little bit about, more new employee orientations. But even, I, I completely understand what you're saying about this sort of overwhelming and this pile of paper that you get when you're a new employee, is that there's a monthly email sent to HR um, among the various city agencies. We have on-site presentations and agency health and wellness fair where we talk to uh, city employees and our representatives talk to city employees about all the possible um, uh, programs that we have for physical and mental health um, resources. Kevin, do you know which agencies get that? Which, I'm sorry? The newsletter, which agencies get the newsletter? All the agencies. All the agencies get the monthly email to all of the, I'm sorry, human resources contacts at every single agency. So I just, Kevin would be able to, um, could you explain a little bit more about um, the intake process and people? Okay, when, when an employee uh, calls us for services, um, we get some information from them and they're given to a counselor uh, right away. Uh, everybody, in, well, everybody in my staff is a licensed mental health counselor, social worker, mental health counselor, psychologist. Uh, that person then will get the information uh, and we'll talk with the person about what's going on uh, and what services they're requesting. They either offer it in, in, uh, in person session, a phone sessions uh, to come in with them or their family member uh, if it is a family member child they're asking for, we do ask the parent to come and bring the child because we feel that the child has a right to have their say in the whole thing so that we really do see what's going on in the family. Um, and then from there, the council will work with the person and get the services they need and we'll keep in contact until the services provided to the employee and we'll follow up with whether the service is appropriate, whether the therapist is comfortable with it or not. And, and just to uh, add one on to the commissioner's uh, statement, we also do supervisory training, and that's to, for the person to identify problems and that might be showing up with the employee. And we go what we call by a five-step model, and it's really looking at job performance, not the mental health issues or anything else, because we don't want a supervisor to be a therapist. You want them to do their job as a supervisor, but there will be deteriorating job performance that the supervisor can identify and then recommend that the person, you know, this is going, you know, we see this behavior, you see a job um, performance deteriorating and we have services that are free and confidential to you. I'm just thrown, a little bit thrown off by the number because if we, we're saying we have one, a workforce of over a million, right? 1.25 million. No, that's the, no, I'm sorry. Is, that's just, just, just to clarify, that's the number. 1.25 million is the number of active employees, retirees, and their dependents who are covered under health insurance, both physical and mental, and um, the number of city employees is, is almost 400,000. Okay, but that's still, I mean, we're, we're only getting close to maybe 8,000 calls through the EAP. Does that sound like a small number to you? Or is, I mean, I don't... Well, I think that, let me start by saying that, that the number of calls that we get, I mean, so we are one, we are one, the EAP is one resource to, for people to ask, to, to ask about uh, benefits and, and ask for help. Mm -hmm. There are also the um, New York City Be Well, of course, as well as um, in the uniformed agencies, there are the EAP programs. I think that there are, oh, I know that there are more, um, j just the numbers that we are getting into our city EAP doesn't represent the number of contacts that are for, that it doesn't represent the number of employees who are reaching out looking for help. It, that number would be more than that. Okay. 
Um, I'm gonna yield to uh, Deputy Majority Leader Crumble because I know that um, her time is precious. And so it's always yours, Alika, don't worry. <laughs> Your time is precious too. <laughs> Just wanted to go over just a few logistical questions about this. Um, <clears throat> is there a plan in place to account for the additional demand in programs like Employee Assistance Program and Thrive NYC? The bill requires the mental health coordinator to outreach to city agency staff, and presumably there will be an increase in requests for mental health services. Sorry. So your your question is is are the resources available? Is there a plan in place? Correct. That was your that was your question. So to the extent that we would have on the for the on representing the city OLR as an oversight agency, um, we would have any additional programming that we would need. So we we have the resources in place at the current time for Workwell NYC that we've talked about. Um, at its current levels. Um, we've also had resources in place for the DOE expansion for EAP program. Um, to the extent that we need, um, it, there's any reference to an additional mandate for additional programming, we would have our conversation with our colleagues at OMB to talk about what exactly it is that we need and what, um, what resources we would need as a result of that. Uh, what training is being considered for the mental health coordinator? So, so right now, we have New York City OLR through our WorkWell program has um, um, ambassadors and champions in the city agencies as well as our WorkWell staff that guide and provide guidance. Um, there are um, a number of different um, um, educational opportunities that they have to work with our work well staff, that people on this, people look, uh, and city employees who are in each of the different agencies who are interested in being ambassadors and champions, which is what we refer to them as, um, to the extent that they um, need additional training or provided with the information, work well can provide that. To the extent that they need additional training, um, I'm totally open and willing to um, listen, continue having this conversation about what would be the appropriate training if, in fact, it was OLR, um, potentially, who could help lead this discussion going forward about the mental health coordinator. So do you anticipate that most of the hiring for these positions will come from within? I think we would need to assess that. I think that no, we, uh, I haven't, uh, we haven't able, um, haven't, thought it through enough at this point prior to the, the uh, proposal of, of the legislation, I think that the, um, um, the resources that are available now, as part of us discussing it with, the, with you as the sponsor of the bill as well as others, um, we would need to have those conversations to see what that would look like. How many people do you think would, be, would need to be hired in order to fulfill this legislation? So right now we have three, approximately 350 to 400 ambassadors in our city agencies who also have a, they have a day job. So they, they, they work performing their duties as a, as I say, a clerical or administrative associate, um, as a member of the trades, um, as members of and in performing all the occupational groups that the city of New York employs. Um, to the extent we would, we would need to f sit down and figure out what that would look like if we needed to go outside from the current complement of employees that are currently in an agency. We would hope that we could use the work well uh, program that we have to actually lead the way to expand that to include the mental health as we have the Be Well program to be able to provide resources to city employees so that they're, they're able to get in, re in real time um, as much information as they possibly could so they'd be directed in the right way. My next question is, how will the mental health coordinator address issues regarding Emblem Health's denial of services issues? Um, thank you. Can you, um, can you explain what you mean by uh, denials of service issues? In 2014, then A.G. Schneiderman announced a $1.2 million settlement with Emblem Health. HIP and GHI merged in 2006 yes. for having rendered poor mental health care services. 
Emblem Health routinely denied more intensive levels of care for patients, including drug rehab. Potentially up to 31 million could be reimbursed to some 15,000 members. Yes, thank you. We, I, we are aware of that. These were in relation to um, issues that the Attorney General raised in 2014 about Emblem Health and other insurers not meeting mental health parity requirements. And it was specifically around the way that they were managing the care um, for behavioral health. Um, since then, there was, there was a settlement, and um, we are assured by Emblem Health on behalf of both the HIP HMO and the GHI CBP plan that they are completely in compliance with parity. And we have not seen those types of care management denials in quite some time. Because the concern would be that through this coordinator, through the help and the support, and the recommendations that our own employees are getting, that when they actually go to providers for help and support, that they could be denied based off of their policies and the coverage that we currently offer. If they were, if they were denied, they have appeal rights um, to, uh, to Emblem Health and appeal rights um, for additional independent review as well, but probably the best way to resolve those issues is by calling OLR and getting us involved in trying to resolve those issues. Would the, as this legislation was created to have a coordinator of sorts, could the coordinator in that case then be your representative to help you through the process of this? Because when you're on the verge of a mental health breakdown, as Councilmember Ayala, you know, or if you have mental health issues or just mental disabilities in many ways, you really don't have the capacity to press one, call back, speak to the operator, hang up, call back. Do you have this number? Why don't you fill out this form and this packet and get back to us and then press one? But what you also can do is you can mail in the packet after you figured it out and you've called your lawyer, press one. Like, that's enough to send you off the deep end if you're in a good mood. That's true. <laughs> and life that's is going true. great. We really appreciate that comment. Um, I think that uh, one, one resource right now that's in, that's in effect that can handle that is also the EAP program, and they often do get involved in those types of issues as well as helping to find people a provider. Um, it's certainly possible we could look at the mental health coordinators as um, an appropriate location for part of that role. Kevin, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I think we've, we've handled it in the past where employees have been, had a problem getting into a facility or there might have been something happened along the way. Um, I, I think the EAPs are the best, including union EAPs, are the best in some ways to coordinate the care because everybody's a mental health professional. So we can talk with the treatment facility and look at really what the problem is and why what they've presented to manage to the, say the uh, health plan and what the health plan is saying back, we can sort of cut through what's being said because we understand the lingo of mental health. I think that's the best way to go because I think coordinator, if they're not a mental health professional, might muddy the waters a little bit. So if you're saying depression and someone is saying it's major depression, well, what's the difference between it and the AP person would be able to explain that and work through the issues. So I think a mental health professional is the best way to go to try to alleviate some of the problems, unless it's just regular benefit issues of, you know, a benefit has been expired or something along those lines. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Council Member Ayala. We have been joined by Council Member Richie Torres. Go ahead. Thank you, Council Member. Oh, sorry, you're okay. Thank you. Um, it's not clear from the testimony where the administration stands on intro 1792. I, I know it says you support the intent of the legislation, but it's certainly possible to support the intent while opposing the legislation. So 
Um, yes, thank you, Council Member, for yeah. the question. It, thanks for, the, for allowing us the opportunity to clarify. So we, uh, the City Administration OLR, as an oversight agency, is um, absolutely in favor of having providing as many resources as possible to both our city employees as well as our city public at large. I'd like to invite up for a moment Dr. Myla Harrison from DOHMH, who can explain more in answer to your question. Thank you very much uh, for the question. So um, the summary of the bill would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop a list of all free behavioral health services and share the information with any city agency that provides direct services to young adults, families, and children. And as uh, we said, we support the intent of that bill and in fact are already doing that. So as the health department, um, everyone, including city employees, should have knowledge about and access to mental health information and supports and services, regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of their insurance status. Um, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene works with Vibrant, which used to be known as the Mental Health Agency of New York City, to run NYC Well, which is our call, text, and chat feature that has information and referrals on all mental health services um, and uh, substance use services in New York City. And they keep that up to date. It's an information line. It's also our crisis line. And so anybody can call on behalf of themselves or somebody um, they work with or know and love who might be in crisis and can get uh, urgent help as needed. And so this already exists as a resource for folks in New York City. Um, people can access it again online or on their phone um, or on their computer um, in many ways. What about situations where, what about rank and file employees and human resource agencies that serve populations in need that, you know, populations that could benefit from, from healthcare services. Do, do those employees, are those employees briefed about the full range of services available to the populations that they serve in agencies like HRA or DHS and all the rest? So that's a good question. So through another resource we have, um, mental health first aid training. Mental health first aid training is um, a day-long training that helps people understand what mental health looks like, what mental illness looks like, when people might need help. As part of that training, which has been offered to um, something like 68,000 city employees already, um, they get information about how to access N NYC Well, how to get care when care is needed for people that they either are working with or live with, those sorts of situations. But we're far, sorry, how many people received the training? About 60, 68, yeah, 68,000 city, city employees through city employees. many city agencies so far, and many more outside of city agencies, but um, certainly that is um, another way to get information out there. Again, about how to access help for people and when to know somebody might need additional help when it comes to mental health. Yeah, the, because the bill was based on an observation that, you know, there are community-based organizations that might have funding to provide mental health services, but might lack the volume, whereas city agencies, no one serves more people than the, the largest provider of social services are New York City agencies. Right, that have that often have the volume, but might not have the funding, and so I was I, I was concerned about a lack of coordination and communication between the organizations that have the funding for the services and the city agencies that have the volume of clients who could benefit from those services. So, is there a system in place for ensuring that there is coordination, a system of referral between community-based organizations and city agencies around mental health services? I'm not sure I'm understanding yeah. the intent, uh, actually, and I, we'd be happy to talk further if it will help. You know, we can talk more detail. Well, because it sounds like what you have is simply a process by which you refer people to the hotline. You know, if you have any mental health condition, just call this hotline. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something more concrete, just a, a referral relationship between community-based organizations that provide mental health services and agencies that serve populations that are most predisposed to anxiety, depression, the whole range of mental illnesses. So I'm looking for something more concrete than simply saying, hey, call this hotline or call 311. Yeah, so, so I think I understand um, your question a little bit better. It's yeah. about how do you 
um, have people not fall through the cracks? How do, how do people know what's available and out there for them? There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of providers in New York City that, that offer mental health resources. And so that list is long. Um, and that list needs to be kept up to date. So we're using NYC Well through Vibrant as a place to make sure that list is always up to date. There's information there about um, the population someone um, that an agency will serve, about the insurances that they accept, about the languages that are spoken. And those can change over time. So there's, it's a resource that helps keep that information up to date. Yeah. Um, and yet it's not the only way to get care for people. So it is, it is one way for people to know what's out there, and it's a centralized way to, to get that information out there. Um, it's not the only way. Yeah, and, and I guess I don't want to dwell on this, but you, you know, any one of us can call the hotline. You could call the hotline, I could call the hotline. What I'm hoping for is just closer coordination, uh, a more systematic referral relationship, between community-based providers and city agencies that target populations that we know are at risk of mental illness. Like we, we know what the predictors are. And rather than wait for those people to call the hotline, we should proactively target them. You know, if, if, if we're connecting them to other city services and we can simultaneously connect them to mental health services that would benefit them, we should do so. Especially if the, if the services are there and the funding for the services are there. Like we, you know, my theory is we can serve more people simply through better coordination. And, and I think that's, that's the, the logic of the bill. So, so thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Borelli. Um, we will now be hearing from Council Member Ampri Samuel. Good afternoon. I, um, I guess um, Council Member Torres and Majority Leader Combo kind of went through the line of question that I had, because I was going to ask about the expansion of the EAE program, um, and to kind of give us a more detail about how um, do you work in certain agencies, because when I was reading through the testimony, and I see the child protective specialists um, highlight, mm -hmm. and the language here, just reading it back, says, working as a CPS worker is rewarding, However, it can put many CPS employees at the risk for compassion fatigue. And then um, when you read down to the new DOE program, mm -hmm. um, the language that's used says, um, where is it? Now the NYC EAP will deliver comprehensive services to help DOE employees overcome personal problems mm -hmm. that diminish quality of life and interfere with effectiveness on the job. And um, and I think about the teachers um, in our schools, and in, in particular in schools where um, you, know, you have a high rate of children in transitional housing and um, families just struggling in certain communities. And those teachers, to me, seem to be the equivalent of a child protective specialist because they are dealing with compassion fatigue as well. And it's not necessarily that they've come into school with all these personal problems, but the fact that their problems are coming from the fact that they want to work so hard mm -hmm. um, helping the children and the families that they serve. And so I was just wondering um, um, if you can kind of explain the, the difference between or you know, the similarities between the work that you'll be doing with the CPS workers and the new program with DOE. But you, you kind of talked about that, but I just wasn't still sure because I still know so many struggling professionals in different agencies that um, are told to call a hotline mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, knowing that they have these issues with the services that they provide. So that was my sure. line of questioning that you answered. But. Right, thank you for cl clarifying that in the testimony. You're absolutely right about that, about the way we reference in the testimony. So I appreciate the opportunity to explain a little bit further, and I'll have Kevin explain a little bit further, but just, just as a, as, uh, initially, I'd like to say that the, the, the uniqueness of our city EAP program is that we're able to customize by agency the, 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 based on the agencies and based on the, the occupational group of employees and based on the city, the, the public that they, that 
city employees take care of, we're able to customize those EAP programs and talk with them and bring them programming like workshops and clinics and, and, and uh, make those presentations to them based on the work that they are actually doing. So a teacher in a classroom, as you mentioned, is not going necessarily going to be the same. There, may be, there could be some overlap. Um, but, but as versus a child protective specialist who is dealing, going into a home and dealing with, with different circumstances. But I'll let, I'll let Kevin explain a little bit more on the uniqueness of how we're able to customize both of those programs as we look forward to the future, as we mentioned, the DOE program we just announced as of this past Friday, February 21st. So there'll be, there'll be a, a, a up and coming period of transition where we're talking about that. But Kevin? Uh, thank you very much for the question because I think it's a very important question and there are a lot of similarities. If we just look at the three separate programs that we set up to, to meet the needs of the agency, when there was a traumatic event up in, uh, up in the, actually the Kingston site office up in uh, upstate New York, we realized there was about 1,000 workers who worked for the city of New York who didn't have access to the employee's assistance program just because of where they are. So we worked with DEP, and DEP suggested that we, they funded a line to work with them. And that brought us to the ACS. ACS was realizing the turnover rate is very high, uh, the burnout rate, and that they felt that maybe there was something needed to be able to work with those employees. And having started my career in child welfare on the other side of it, I understand, trust me, the, the compassion fatigue and the need of, of that population of working with them. Uh, so we developed this program with ACS. That led us to DOE, and I agree with you. We've just started with DOE on Friday at 4.30. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of interesting phone calls, and a lot of them are around teachers uh, experiencing trauma in the workplace. Um, uh, my parents, were t my, parent, well, my mother was a teacher, and it, you sort of look at it that uh, you're uncertainly given a child's life as well as an ACS worker, and, and you're trying to mold them, and things that our children are going through now are so much more traumatic than when I was a child, or when my kids who are, who are young adults now, it's a different population, and I think teachers, I agree with you, teachers have a very difficult time, and I think between us working with DC 37 and working with the UFT, we're going to develop a very comprehensive way of, of working with the teachers. The UFT was overwhelmed, DC 37, and so we, with the additional funding from OMB, we're able to develop probably a program that'll be able to address all these issues. Um, my deputy director, Claire Caminaretta, has uh, Dr. Claire Cameron-Redder actually, has been researching all the needs that we're seeing with teachers of their own compassion fatigue, their burnout. You're right, the amount of kids we have to deal with who are coming from shelters. It's a different environment than just how children react to each other. Um, so the teachers are very difficult and we funded six to 15 uh, different new councils to work in this population, plus four supervisors plus a, uh, a clinical director. So I think we're going to start addressing it. We'll have more information as it goes along. But trust me, since 4.30 when the fund was announced, <laughs> we've gotten very interesting phone calls and addressing what you're saying. OK, thank you. My um, last question um, is related to the licensed um, social workers. So under state law, insurance companies give insurer groups the option to cover social workers who have a LCSW licensing for therapy, which is widely recognized as more cost effective than psychiatrists. The city has gone further and determined that they will not cover an LCSW unless they have the R privilege designation, which requires three more years of supervised training and so the question is, what is the R privilege de delegation, I mean designation? And um, with that, I have to explain that the city already has a limited number of practitioners to provide mental health care. Um, why are we adding additional barriers if that is the case for treatment? Mm -hmm. So if there's anybody that can so explain I think, that. So um, I'm going to let uh, Kevin explain a little bit about the, the reference to the R designation, but I think this we're going to need to we're need, going to need to go back and find some different different additional information. I have follow up with you about what uh, about the specific question that you're asking. But but Kevin, we can explain a little bit about the R program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm an LCS to be with the R. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, you the perfect, it's the perfect R. There you go. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, when that law was uh, uh, passed a number of years ago, 
30 years ago. It gave the rights, you're correct, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers by law have to be uh, paid by insurance if one is paid. Uh, the R is just mean reimbursable, so it's your three years plus another three years, so it's six years. And I think what they try to do is equate it to a psychologist because it's more education, they're getting your PhD than getting your, LS, your MSW. So I felt, I think the bill itself made it uh, that you had more supervision before they made you reimbursable. That's where the R comes from. There is a bill in New York State uh, that hasn't been signed yet that has eliminated the R. Mm -hmm. uh, and it still hasn't been signed, but it will allow any LCSW uh, to be reimbursed, removed in the ER. So it would be your license, your LMSW, then you'd pass your, uh, your test for your LCSW plus your additional, I think, 3,000 hours. I'm past my R, how many? 2,000. I didn't have to do it anymore, so, uh, so it's 2,000 hours. So there is a bill in this New York State eliminating the R, to be honest with you, and if that's eliminated, then we wouldn't. But the R is just, it's just they felt when they gave the R was to make sure the quality of mental health treatment was there at the time, and it was about 30 years ago, maybe 40. So since you know about this bill, do you know what's happening with it? Yeah, it we've, like been, we've been reaching, it. it hasn't been signed yet, and it was in this last uh, budget bill, and uh, so if it's not signed, I'm assuming, I'm only a social worker, uh, <laughs> that then in, in, it would have to be reinduced in the next, uh, reinduced. I, I have no idea why it was never signed. Um, maybe it opens up the other licenses, I'm not sure. Do we um, have a number of the uh, like New York City LCSWs, like the percentage that have the R designation and who don't? Get that from no. Would we be able to get that from anyone? I'm just curious be, right. now because right, of and your the question goes to the number of in the in the five boroughs, yeah. for example, yeah, yeah. in the five yeah. boroughs, the number of LCSWs with the, with and without the R. That'd be helpful. Yeah, we could we could we'll we could out. do we can we can look into it and research and, and get back to you follow up. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to go back a little bit because I, I, I still don't feel like I kind of, I, that I heard what I, I wanted to hear. So uh, does each city agency regularly update employees about mental health care uh, benefits? I'm sure you, I mean, you wouldn't be able to answer for every agency, but is it your impression that they do? So as an oversight agency, it, it's difficult for me to, to um, give you information about each individual agency, but to the extent that OLR um, is, a, is a resource for every single agency to provide employees, and we send out, as I mentioned, that monthly communication to the, each agency's a, HR division, um, what's going on um, with, with uh, uh, our, four, our four different work well programs. Um, as far as the health insurance and what the benefits are and how you can gain access and who you can speak to, all of that information is, is on the OLR website. Um, and people can easily access that. Any city employee can easily access that. But when the information gets to the HR department, is it up to the HR department to determine what to do with the information? Or is there a requirement that ensures that HR is, um, that the, is, is ensuring that the information is trickling down to the employees? Is what I'm trying to. I mean, I get a lot of I get a lot of information through my office, and sometimes it sits with my staff, right? And so I get that th this happens, right? Everybody's so busy, and is it a priority for each agency to ensure that the information that you are submitting to them is trickling down to the employee, and not just during the times when there's a when they're being onboarded? Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you for that question. So I think that um, with our 300, 350 to 400 ambassadors that OLR has for the WorkWell programs also, I think that's also another way of another outlet, not just sort of the HR office um, responsibility to, to communicate with city employees. We have ambassadors in every single one of our agencies that, we're, that we work with every single day, the WorkWell program staff works with, so that we can make sure that those people, ambassadors and actually champions who are sort of examples um, of, of, of mental and, 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 and physical wellness who actually go out and talk to their colleagues, talk to their fellow employees to provide them with information and, and insight. And that is one of their roles that we, you know, sort of help. They, 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 they voluntarily raise their hand and say they like to do that. And there's a lot of excitement about there about people sharing the information. Okay. Is there information about mental health care coverage and benefits available in common areas, uh, spaces such as like the break rooms. So I'm not. It, uh, I can't. It's 
difficult for me to speak on behalf of all of all the individual agencies. Um, to the extent that we send out the information to the HR agencies every month, uh, we certainly encourage them to then provide that information to their employees. You encourage, but you don't require. Uh, I do not. The, don't um, as an oversight agency, it's it's difficult for me to require okay. such a thing. Okay. Um, approximately how many mental health providers are in the network of each of the city's three main insurance plans? Thank you again for that question. Um, we actually, I, I have the numbers for the two major insurance plans that cover 95% uh, of the city employees. That's the, uh, the uh, CBP plan through GHI and the HIP HMO plan. Um, there are over 8,000 in the HIP HMO and over 6,000 in, uh, in the GHI network. How does that number compare um, to other insurance networks? So um, we're, we're, not, we're not sure what the numbers are in other insurance networks. We do feel that the number that are in, particularly in the GHI network, since there are less in the GHI network than there are in the HIP HMO network, we do feel the GHI network could use some um, improvement in the number of providers. And we are working with um, Beacon Health and Emblem Health on that now. And we hope that in the next um, four to six months that we'll see an additional thousand or so providers added into that network. Of the providers that are in the network now, um, are they geographically spread throughout uh, the city to, meet the, the, to better meet the needs of the city employees? And are these providers culturally and language competent um, as well? These are all really important questions, and we're very committed um, to having diversity uh, to having di diversity in the network. Um, there are providers in every single county um, in the five boroughs and all of the surrounding counties, and each one has psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, and social workers in the network, as well as some other types of providers like nurse practitioners. Um, and there is a substantial amount in, um, in each borough. That being said, we do have um, the problem in this city that um, is available, that is a problem nationally, which is that there is a lack of availability in some of the federally de designated mental health professional shortage areas. So there are shortage areas in some of the um, in some of the local areas, but in each of our um, in each of our boroughs, in each of our counties, there are providers. Are you concerned uh, that? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to on the on the um, on the language the issue regarding languages. I just wanted to 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 mention for um, when selecting a provider from the website or by phone, an employee can specifically. Uh, can specify different language requirements as well as gender and ethnic requirements to accommodate their preferences. We also have the same similar um, uh, uh, when we're doing intake uh, on the EAP side, which Kevin can uh, can specify um, about ask, to match people up with the city employee up who needs the in information uh, with the appropriate provider. Okay, every when uh, an employee calls for uh, and seeking uh, mental health services, this is other services. Uh, we'll go through everything and we will ask, do you have a, a need that you would like you know, besides your zip code or do you want to have a therapist downtown? If you live in Brooklyn, you know, it's easy to go before going home or do you want one on a weekend in Brooklyn where you're living? And do you have any requests you have, uh, you know, a racial, or ethnic? Uh, is there some needs that you feel that uh, is important for you? So and it's up to us to find that per type of person. Some get very difficult. You know, you want somebody between the age of 22 and 24, and a psychiatrist, say, and it's very difficult to get. Um, to your answer of how many social workers uh, GHI have, 6,527. I mean, I think that the concern is that we, you know, we want to ensure that employees are not 
facing an additional barrier by then having to leave their community to re- receive services, right? Because we know that people don't often get from point A to point B um, when they have to leave their network and their communities. No, we, we give them the opportunity in the community, or it might be easier for them to do it at, be in this area here if they work downtown. So they'd rather do it on their lunch hour. They try to do it on, you know, going before going home so they can set up the childcare the, that way. So we go to what the needs of the employee ask for. We don't mandate where they do the treatment. We ask them, do you have a certain requirement that you like? And then we'll meet that need. Do we know how competitive the rates are that are being paid to providers compared to other health insurance providers? And is there a concern that the existing low rates aren't incentivizing a broad pool of talented providers? Thank you for bringing up the question of, of access to care and the rates that are being paid. Um, I, this is a very, it's a very important issue to us to ensure that employees have appropriate access to care. We do have a substantial pool of providers that do accept um, the, the rates from Emblem Health. Um, and uh, for us, it's an important balancing act between the fact that we've been tasked with making sure that the coverage is affordable at the same time that we're tasked with making sure that it's extensive. And we've worked very hard to keep the low employee co-pays that we have and the free coverage that we have for now and into the future. Um, we do believe that there are, that some of the rates that are being paid um, may be lower than what's paid by, um, by other insurers. And to the extent that uh, negotiating with new providers um, will be happening in, in the near future, that may impact the rates that we're paying. Since 2014, there have been several lawsuits against GHI brought by city employees and retirees, alleging that GHI, Emblem, and Empire have defrauded taxpayers of more than a billion dollars, provided inadequate health care while collecting billions of dollars in premiums, and have filed false claims to overstate their expense by an average of $55 million per year between 2008 and 2014 and that they have committed unfair and deceptive practices. Without commenting on the lawsuits, has the city considered finding a new insurer? Yeah, without you talking to everything, I'll say. Yeah. Um, th this is something that is, um, finding a new insurer is something that is subject to collective bargaining. Um, and that it is something that has come up in discussions with the Municipal Labor Committee, and we continue to have those discussions. Okay. If, if, we, if there's a finding that an insurer defrauded the city of New York, we're powerless to remove that insurer? <laughs> Outside the context of collective bargaining? That strikes me as strange. Right. So, so council member, um, so to the extent that we have a relationship with the Municipal Labor Committee and we administer the health benefits program together, um, there are decisions that are made together um, as far as putting out, there's actual requirements going back to the 80s where we actually, the ability for us to put out a separate RFP unilaterally and separate apart from them, um, there was actually litigation about that, um, and it was determined that we actually need to do it with them together. To the extent that we need to address problems with an insurer, to the extent that they're doing something, if they've done anything that we find um, controversial, we, can ha we have those conversations with them. And as far as this 2014 Attorney General investigation, my understanding is that, um, that Emblem actually addressed these particular issues, and they are now going forward um, with having those issues resolved. Thank you, Rich. Um, fi my final question. So would you say that the city has been satisfied with the mental health care coverage provided by the three main insurance plans used? We're actually, um, I, th that's a great question. Um, we are proud of the coverage that we provide. Um, 
It has no annual deductible. It's free to employees. It has very low per visit co-pays. It costs people $15 to go for, um, for any kind of treatment, including to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a social worker. Um, so that on, on one hand, we're really proud of the fact that I, I think we offer great coverage. That being said, we're always looking for ways to improve it, and we are looking now at expanding the number of mental health providers um, that, are, uh, that are in the network, and we're looking at adding uh, this telemedicine benefit that we think will, um, will be used by more people because of the convenience and the privacy that it offers. So we're always looking for new and innovative ways to do things to expand access to mental health coverage and all our coverage. Is SPOP one of your providers by any chance? Uh, is a mental health program for older adults? I guess if you have a retiree um, constituency and that's a, it's a, it's a service that's provided in home. What, I'm sorry. what was Bop, the program called? SPOP. I think it's a special program for older people. Just out of curiosity. Special program yeah, for older people. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not aware of that, but we'll find out. Okay. We'll find um, out. I actually lied. I did have one other question because I needed just some clarification on a program. What is the, what is the difference between the WorkWell NYC program and the EAP? So the EAP program um, is a program that's been that was established back in back in the 80s in in for OLR as a citywide oversight. Um, the specific work um, uh, the work that's done through this EAP is over is is managed and overseen by certified mental health professionals who are working with employees on a daily basis to deal with personal issues, professional issues. Um, and other related related concerns, also talking about health insurance. Our WorkWell program that was established in 2016 is um, our on-site, um, on the site, on the location program that where we are we are encouraging city employees because we we do we do agree and encourage that all employees. Um, are, are able to exercise both their sort of their, their physical selves and their mental selves, um, and to the extent that they are able to um, move more, eat more, um, um, be be well, be more resilient in their in their lives as city employees. We know that city employees take care of many many um, different populations of of people, and what we say here is that to the extent that we. That, that city employees take care of others, take care of members of the public. We are here at OLR and our work well programs to take care of city employees. So that is something that we, that we truly um, take very seriously and want to ensure um, that those elements uh, and that people on their, on their work site, for example, to the extent that an employee, if you give them a program, say, a, a, um, a weight loss program or something like that, and say, okay, here's a here's a website. Go go home and look on your computer and and work all that, you know, and good luck or something. Um, to the extent that we're able to have these programs in on in, during city dur during the in the workplace that people use during their breaks, during their meals, either before hours or after hours, we're able we're finding out that people are able to uh, since we spend more half of them more than half of our waking hours, our city employees all workers spend more than half their waking hours in their in their workplace, um, creating an environment where um, where that sort of uh, uh, level of care and and the attention that we spend on making sure that people are, are responding, are able to respond in the best possible way, means that they can eventually respond in the best possible way to, to the public, the New York City public at large, which is what we are, which is the service that New York City is, is, is providing on a regular, everyday basis. Okay. Do you, do you anybody have any other questions? Yes. Wondering, do, has there been a, a, a maybe a comprehensive analysis in which you identify the positions in city government that have a, mental, a high mental health risk? And then, like, are there positions in city government that have a high mental health risk but, do, but lack access to on-site services? Has that kind of analysis been done? 
Right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that um, in our specifically our dealings with the ACS workers, the child protective yeah. specialist workers, we identified that uh, and the agency identified that actually very early on. Um, and we were able to come up with a program where we were able to have those four on site uh, mental health providers working with them on 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 site um, to the extent that um, we also have, of course, um, through through the NYPD, there are the various programs. Most recently, the finest program that was established back in back in um, October of 2019. Um, there, that free confidential 24/7 resource for our members of the service are able to access that service as well as others. I think that that's another area where the police department has has taken has taken that next step in trying to provide other opportunities for, for members of the law enforcement to um, actually seek out and get help on a confidential basis. And, and I, I don't know the details of the program, but are, are there, you know, are there social workers or some kind of mental health professionals on site at the precincts themselves? So I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I have um, Michael Clark from the NYPD is here and he could provide an answer on that. Uh, so for the, the finest program, it's not. It's a 24-hour uh, phone call that accesses to services and mental health help. Um, we have been working on trying to create more of an opportunity to have psychologists in the field with officers. Um, it's something we're working on right now, um, but doesn't yet exist. But the goal is to have them in every precinct or in what? I don't know if in every precinct, but to have them available for officers. Uh, it's, you know, it's not... It's, it's, it's what we're working on to, to get to a place, um, but right now we're taking first steps to begin working on that. Um, but it, it, right now it's not there. And, and beyond the NYPD and ACS, what other kinds of positions have access to on-site mental health services? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, council members, could beyond, you repeat beyond, the question? Beyond ACS and uh, the NYPD, what other positions in city government have access to mental health services, on-site mental health services? Sure. Uh, Kevin, can you respond? Okay, thank you. The, uh, we have, because uh, we have a separate agreement to uh, do the Employees Assistance Program for the Health and Hospitals Corporation, we have a social worker attending at least one day a week in each of the hospitals um, as they open up to us. Some of the as you know, hospitals have a very tight space to give us office space, but we're getting more and more. I think we're probably in about, I can't in amount. But the, the, uh, the social workers there are 11 to 7 to help pick up the swing shift so the night uh, employees can also have access to, to the AP accounts for on site. Bellevue, Metropolitan, um, Kings County, um, Bellevue, Metropolitan, Kings County, Elmhurst is opening up. Uh, Queens County Hospital, Coney Island, not yet because they're still recovering from Sandy. They're still trying to do it. So we do have a uh, person in each one of those offices, and Jacoby. Uh, so they're there at least one day a week, 11 to 7. Do we know if our, our social service agencies typically have on-site mental health professionals? Because I feel like in, our, in the area of social services, people are chronically underpaid, chronically overworked. The stressors can be corrosive to mental health. And uh, just for the sake of morale and motivation, it would be useful to have mental health professionals on site. Um, do we know if DHS and HRA and, and all the social service organizations that impose an, an enormous mental burden on, on, on our public workforce, do we know if they have access to on site mental health services? Uh, they don't have access to on site because uh, they have a a huge amount of sites between um, between DH, I mean DDS now. Uh, they're very active with us, though. Uh, we have a lot of employees come from HRA. Or, or any social workers on staff, any mental health professionals on staff who can rotate, who can go from? Not right now. See, I, I think that's a problem. Like, I think every, and I would say even for the city council, every... You know, the, the stressors of constituent service and social services is an enormous strain on our public workforce, and all of us should, to the extent possible, should have access mm -hmm. to the, every, every agency, frankly, should have, an on, should have right. social workers and mental health professionals, in my opinion. But. Right. Uh, council member, I, so I think to the extent that we have the availability in ACS for our, our Division of Child Protection Services, um, that is a group that we were able to to, to, to focus on. I think that as more conversations go on, um, we, 
can continue looking. We were able to, um, in essence, we went from a staff uh, uh, prior, to, prior to this past Friday, we went from a staff of 15 mental health uh, providers in our EAP program to a staff of, of 46 ultimately. So we've, in, in essence, tripled our staff to deal with the expansion into the Department of Education. So we're um, constantly looking to see if there are areas and ways that we can actually, um, if there are, there are um, if people are looking for additional help and additional resources, we will try and figure out a way to craft a program um, I don't necessarily know that it can be on site necessarily, but depending on resources, but we're able to craft a program where we can start to address these very important issues for them as in, in a specific occupational group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and welcome to our committee, and we look yeah. forward to continuing to work with you. Thanks. Great. Thank you very um, much. We will now be calling up our one and only panel, um, Beverly Johnson. Deron Marino, Christian uh, Hugen, and Kathy Rivera. Good afternoon, Beverly. Is the light on? Yeah. Okay. You can start. Good afternoon. Honorable Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health Development, Disability, Alcoholism, Substance Abuse, and Disability Services. Ms. Laurier Combo, Majority Leader and Primary Sponsor of the Bill. Mr. Eric Drew Cohen, Member, Council Member and Primary Sponsor of the Bill. That's not here and council members. My name is Beverly Johnson. I'm here to testify about a law that I believe should be enacted as soon as possible. The bill, Intro 0064 2018, is about hiring a mental health coordinator to inform about mental health support and services that are available to them. This local law would be a first. It starts at the city level for New York City. There's been a lot done for people with physical disabilities that led to great advantages under the ADA, Americans with Disability Act. We are all in recovery from something. Most of us will experience some form of trauma in our lives because life events can be stressful. No one will escape unscathed in this time. Many of us at some point in our lives will need some sort of mental health care. Again, the bill is about hiring a mental health coordinator to inform city employees about mental health support and services that are available to them. This law will be consistent with the principal goals of the ADA. When enacted, this bill will provide many people suffering from mental illness the help they need to, to know where to turn. In the ADA, the federal government gives the discretion to the employer to give or not to give a reasonable accommodation. I'm a person who has met the challenges of mental illness in my life. For me and many like me want to work and it's part of my DNA and my therapy. Work gives me a sense of belonging and being appreciated for my contributions to make a positive difference in the lives of others. It is ironic that I was forced to resign when I worked at a city hospital. My job title was peer specialist. I worked with adult psychiatric patients in the outpatient treatment program. When, when, I, when, when job related issues began to trigger in me, latent feelings of inadequacy, I reached out to the Associate Director of Human Resources. The outcome was that I was transferred to another department temporarily, but that the temporary nature of the assignment and the treatment by managers of coworkers who are still under mandatory employment probationary period just added to my distress. Consequently, I resigned and was afraid for a long time to try work again. 
I believe that a better outcome could be achieved if supervisors and employees were aware of mental health support and services that are available. In closing, my experience is not uncommon. The need for information for employees recovering from mental illness for support in adjusting to the stresses and the complex interactions in the workplace shouldn't warrant a forced resignation. Again, having a mental health coordinator on site can only be helpful so that employees will know where they, where, where, where they can get help and what their rights are. I know work is very important, and I know that I have to work. I think communication is the key for dealing with all types of people on the job. Everyone should be respected and heard in every possible way at work and in life. If people, value, if people feel valued at work, they would have fewer problems at work. I'm convinced that if I would have had a health coordinator available who was not part of my work unit to discuss the events that, that happened just after I was hired, it would have helped me deal more effectively with the situations that arose. I believe there are many others who find themselves in situations that spiral downwards too quickly. This proposal law would help many of them stop their slide down and remain in the workforce. I want to thank everyone for their time and attention to this law, and hopefully it will be enacted as soon as possible. Remember, your vote will make all the difference. Thank you all again. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you. That was, yeah. Thank you. I wish we could clap, but we're not allowed to. Um, yeah, yeah, it was very moving. But I, we were just having this discussion about having to force an employee to self-disclose that they're going through something, right? So sometimes, because the information is not available, we're in essence forcing employees to tell their uh, immediate supervisors that something is going on. And my concern is that that may lead to termination um, of an employee unnecessarily. And it also, I think, is an invasion of the employee's privacy because you, had, you were, in essence, forced to tell your immediate supervisor what you were going through. Um, so I appreciate you coming today to testify because it really reiterates what we were already kind of feeling um, is happening. But I think the irony in all of this is that you worked in a psychiatric unit was the information not available at all in your in your experience? Was it posted anywhere, um, or was the, did you feel like the only option was to go to your immediate supervisor? Well, you know, okay, you have the EEO and you have the EAP and you have civil liberties and you have uh, an um, employment lawyer. Um, you have disgruntled um, postal people, so. If you don't know, you, I mean, if you don't know where to go and where to turn, then chances are you're going to leave or something's going to happen. It's like a domino effect. I appreciate it. I think Councilmember Cumble, did you have a question? Thank you, Beverly. Beverly Johnson for president. We appreciate your advocacy and the work that you've done. And I believe Councilmember Ayala is also alluding to the fact that it might be even, in addition to this bill, more helpful to have communication or signs within every workplace, like you might have if you are um, pregnant and you need an accommodation. There's signage to let you know that we have paid sick days, that we have pregnancy accommodations, and, and many others. And so the thought would be that the ability to be able to connect to a coordinator through signage versus your supervisor um, might in fact be helpful. Would that have been helpful to you if that was something that was available, some sort of signage? But you seem to really know the system inside and out and all the acronyms and all the abbreviations. You seem to know where to go, but other people might not know where to go. Do you think that signage would help? Yes, I didn't know this, this information at hand when, when I was having the difficulty, so this would be very helpful to people. Mm -hmm. This should be given to you once you go start the process of being employed. Perfect. Did you ever have in your work-related experience, did you ever have a situation that 
modeled what you wanted to see. So you talk about, you've come up with this idea of a coordinator. Did you ever interact with someone that was kind of like a coordinator, although that may not have been their official job, and how they were able to be helpful to you in a situation? No, that wasn't available. Mm. I, I'm, I'm thankful for that because you figured out from that what you actually needed and what so many other people needed. Now, I just wanted to get a clarity. We've been talking a lot about it from the place of trauma in terms of the coordinator. People that may have, are having a nervous breakdown. Individuals that, be, that might have some sort of uh, mental health issues as it relates to stress and that sort of thing. When this was conceived of, I took it more from a place of people that are hired in the workplace that might have um, an intellectual disability or might have, um, they might have, they might be on the spectrum for autism or other issues that are different from trauma related issues. Did you see this as for all? or did you see it for a particular segment? It's for everybody, really. This is, this is something for everybody. Anything can happen to anybody at any given time. Anybody can snap. Any, you don't have to have a diagnosis to, mm -hmm. to, to, to be able to come to this, to, to see a mental health coordinator. Mm -hmm. it, could be available, it should be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody has issues. Everybody's recovering from something that's traumatic, that's traumatizing. You know, we're all, look, Life is a recovery, birth is a recovery, we're all recovering from something. And we all need some sort of mental health care in our life. So it's for everybody. But, but it triggers down to starting with this, then, then the umbrella opens up to everybody that may need it. I just wanted to hear you eloquent, to be so eloquent the way that you verbalize everything. I feel like it's a book. Um, let me ask you this one final question. Um, in your work experience, did you have issues, as we brought up, as it pertains to health insurance and being able to seek support and help and to be uh, supported through your health insurance plan? Or were you denied, like so many others, when it came time to actually addressing issues? No, I, I didn't have that problem. I, I think that, um, let's see, um, I think that, um, I mean, even if you have a therapist and a psychiatrist, a social a psychologist, social worker, you know that's 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 individual. That's 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 your own business. But to have somebody at work, because those people can't help you at work. You mm -hmm. need to have somebody at work where we can go to and talk to. And that's the whole idea of this lore: is to have someone to talk to. Sure, you could talk to your therapist, you could talk to your psychiatrist, you could talk to your social worker, but they're not a part of the job. There should right. be somebody in place in terms of the job. Well, those are all the questions I have. Beverly, I thank you for your leadership. I thank you for bringing this important legislation to the city council. I thank you for Beverly's law, and I'm so thankful that you have worked so hard to see it through. You should feel very proud this Black History Month. Like I said, rolling right into Women's History Month. You've done extraordinary work, and we at the city council, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I thank hope this you. law is enacted immediately. We need everybody's vote, and hope everybody votes for it. Thank you. Thank you. You can go ahead. Did you have a question, um, Council Member Torres? For Beverly? Before? Beverly, come back. No. And I apologize, I'm going to have to step out. I have a doctor's appointment, speaking of all of this. <laughs> okay. No, I just want to say that your story resonated power powerfully with me because I remember what it was like to be an employee who was struggling with depression, and I felt that same sense of inadequacy, and I felt that the problem was me and there were no mental health services on site available to me. And I was able to rebuild my life and eventually run for the city council and become the youngest elected official in New York City, but your story reminded me of mine, and, and just thank you for sharing it. You, as Lori said, you just conveyed it so powerfully and so gracefully, and um, just have, thank you for having the courage to tell your story. Well, if, if it had to start with someone. Yeah. I had to go through all I went through, and, and it was given to me to come out with this. And I'm humbled and I'm thankful to do a service and try to help everybody, because that's what we're all here to do, is touch people's lives and make people's lives better. Thank you for your. Thank you, Beverly. You can.
Good afternoon. My name is Darren Marino, and on behalf of Samaritan Suicide Prevention Center, which has operated the city's 24-hour suicide hotline for 35 years, I want to thank Chair Diana Ayala and the members of the City Council's com uh, Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addictions for the opportunity to speak today. As a member of the organization that created the world's first suicide hotline almost 70 years ago, and has centers in 42 countries, Samaritans joins everyone here today in expressing our great concern for New York City's growing suicide epidemic. You don't need Samaritans to tell you this epidemic illustrates and the ever-increasing number of New Yorkers who experience depression, trauma, self-harming, and suicidal behavior who are not getting the help that they need. The CDC tells us one in five New Yorkers experiences a psychological disorder every year and up to 60% will never receive care or treatment. That's people of every age, race, culture, sexual identity, and economic standing. That means in 2020, with 8.6 million residents, 1.7 million New Yorkers will experience a disorder and 1 million will not receive the help that they need, making it imperative that we increase our efforts to provide access to care. That said, Samaritan strongly supports both suicide prevention bills proposed by council members, seeing it as an important step in advancing the message, suicide prevention is everybody's business. Considering the number of New Yorkers who are at risk, having a mental health coordinator in every city agency is a necessity. We must have point people who are comfortable with this issue and have the awareness to be both sensitive and effective when responding to a person who is in distress. In terms of 1792, there is no question that all city agency staff should be directed to provide information regarding access to free services available to young adults, families, and children. Samaritans would add that the development of these lists not be left solely to the city, but include direct input from the many community nonprofits that are often excluded from these types of initiatives. This is a necessity if we are truly going to engage more people and break down the silos. More significantly, the need to enhance suicide awareness training in all city agencies is paramount. Again, respectfully, as someone who received his initial mental health training on Samaritan's hotline, went to join the hotline staff, and then with the skills and experience I developed was hired by Vibrant Emotional Health, the contract agency for New York City Well, where I worked for three years, I have a unique perspective to offer. While the primary suicide prevention trainings used by the city certainly have value, the most common being emotional or mental health first aid, these programs tend to be somewhat boilerplate and utilize a clinical or medical approach to educate people, which is fine with certain audiences, uh, but they mostly do not adapt the, the uh, participants, their roles, personalities, and perspectives. Samaritans, with its 65 years of experience training tens of thousands of hotline staff, from all walks of life and hundreds of thousands of lay and professional health care providers all over the world, has found that a more humanistic approach addressing people's fears, concerns, preconceptions, and personal values is paramount in enhancing suicide awareness. We believe how we approach a person in distress, what we see as our role, how we define what is and what is not helping, how we listen and communicate must be at the heart of all suicide prevention training. In fact, Samaritans has submitted an application to the City Council to fund our Suicide Prevention Sensitivity Initiative designed to address this issue and deliver training and technical support to city agencies, schools, the police department, taxi union, and others that work with high-risk populations. With its ongoing support for Samaritan Suicide Hotline and its efforts to enhance suicide prevention in New York City, we thank the City Council for its ongoing leadership and your commitment to help the New Yorkers that are in need. Thank you so much. Thank you. I actually have a question. So out of the people that call in uh, to the hotline, um, are the volunteers on the other line referring them to mental health providers for follow-up care? We, we do have some referrals available, but we, we lead with support uh, rather than focusing on outcome change or, or improvement. Understood. I'm, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to determine whether, for those individuals that require a more long-term approach, 
um, who are being referred, if you or if the team is, is getting any feedback re regarding the inaccessibility of, of providers, the in, uh, difficulties with insurance, with the insurance companies in uh, accessing care? No concrete feedback, really, in terms of... Um, I mean, I'm sure that by the time that people are calling you, they're pretty distraught. Um, exactly, yes. But I just wondered if, in com if, if, if that's something that has ever come across. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Ayala, Deputy Leader Torres, and the members of this committee. My name is Dr. Christian Huygen. I'm a clinical psychologist, and for the past 18 years, I have served as the executive director of Rainbow Heights Club, an agency that many of you are familiar with uh, because you visited us there. Rainbow Heights Club contracts with New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to provide mental health support free of charge to LGBTQ adults who are living with serious mental illness. I'm grateful to this committee for the concern that it consistently shows for the most needy among us as evidenced by the support that our agency has received from the City Council. Because of that, I'm delighted but not surprised that this committee and its chair would propose this legislation. I'm speaking of Introduction 64. I am here to strongly support it. Despite the prevalence of mental illness and related substance abuse disorders, many people struggle to admit to themselves and others that they need and deserve assistance and support. In 2018, a study by Kaiser Permanente that involved 12 million people found that even among people newly diagnosed with depression, only about a third actually follow up and get treatment. Initiative 64 will increase pathways of access to care and reduce the negative outcomes that can happen when people just don't know where to turn. Those who work in city agencies are often on the front lines in the struggle against violence, exploitation, discrimination, trauma, and abuse. Every day, city workers confront human lives impacted by human trafficking, domestic violence, and sexual abuse. Vicarious traumatization is a term for the very real damage that all too often strikes our frontline city employees, social workers, counselors, police, firefighters, EMTs, ACS workers, and thousands of others who face these realities every day. But mental health and related issues are also prevalent among those who may never come in contact with the public. Having visible, accessible mental health coordinators in every city agency will make it possible to reach not only those who are most obviously in need, but also those whom we, we may never suspect would be in need of help. I am here to show disinterested support for this legislation, disinterested because it will not increase our agency's staffing or funding in any way, but it will assure my staff and my clients that the agencies that we refer them to will be staffed by human beings who have the support and the help that they need and deserve. And that is priceless. Thank you so much. We so appreciate your support of the bills. Um, and I owe you another visit. That would be great. Yes, thank you so much. Hello, Ms. Rivera. Hello, how are you? Good afternoon, Chairperson Ayala, members of the, uh, sorry, members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, and Council Member Torres when he comes back. <laughs> um, I'd, like, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Introduction 1792-2019 that is proposed by Council Member Torres. My name is Kathy Rivera, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Care Management Services at JCCA. We are a 200, almost 200-year-old 200 organization working with New York's most vulnerable children throughout New York City. We have historically uh, provided services within the child welfare system, but today I'm very proud to really say we more accurately work uh, to strengthen families and provide them with the tools that they need to live stable, healthy, independent lives. Effective and accessible mental health care, though, is a crucial aspect of that. For the last, uh, for over a decade, we established a care management division to provide wraparound services to support young people with severe emotional disturbances, very often referred to as SED. 
Our programs paired clients from both the foster care world and the OMH world, the Office of Mental Health, with service providers who basically came to the families, right, wherever they were, shelters, schools, anywhere in the community that they felt comfortable. The staff helped children and their caregivers understand their diagnoses, helped practice important coping skills, and encouraged independence and self-advocacy. And because of this, many of our clients were able to successfully avoid hospitalization, um, have further foster care disruptions, return home more quickly, or even be placed in a higher level of care. The theory was, wouldn't it just be better to invest now in care than to wait for a crisis? So that preventive lens, if you will. Um, and it really worked. Um, it was very successful to children and their families, and JCCA became one of the largest providers of these services in New York. About a, over a year ago, New York, New York State decided to invest in providing similar mental health services to all children eligible on Medicaid. In January 2019, the services we used to provide only to that small subset of children that I referenced earlier opened up to any child who meets the referring criteria, including assessment services, so that kids who might not have a qualifying diagnosis and treatment plan could be connected to the appropriate services. These services provide crucial support to, our, to families, enabling them to address mental health needs so as to prevent situations that land young people in the hospital or in the child welfare system. Our staff are extremely eager to provide these and more kinds of supports to families like Lucy, a 13-year-old girl in Brooklyn. I'll share a little bit about Lucy. She was referred to JCCA by a staff member at the shelter that she lived in. Um, she lived there with mom and her younger brother. It's really important to note that the shelter had no idea about these services until our outreach um, intake coordinator went out to them and said, hey, can we do a little presentation for you? These new services went live January of last year. I'd like to make you aware of them. Right away, the staff member connected some families, Lucy being one of them, who could benefit from these services. Um, so after, after we had done the presentation, it was, uh, we learned that Lucy had a history of suicidal ideation, but she had never received treatment for her depression, nor had she even been formally diagnosed. Um, but because of our flexible in-home behavioral health services that she actually now still receives from JCCA, she participates in counseling now, she takes her medication, she engages in treatment, she doesn't skip school, she's doing, getting better grades, she's hopeful and optimistic about her future. Her younger sibling has a heart condition, and before connecting with us, mom was constantly stressed, worrying about two kids, um, and always worrying about Lucy. But now, mom is, uh, feels much better. She knows her daughter is getting the services that she needs. Um, she doesn't have to fear about getting any calls about Lucy harming herself. And these ser services, I think everyone would agree, are far less expensive than one trip to the psychiatric ER, and as you can see, far more productive. It's very exciting to be able to provide these services to many families who are now eligible. We've already developed a partnership with the family clinic at Maimonides, and clinicians now refer on average about 30 families a month. We have also partnered with the Administration for Children's Services very recently in December of 2019 to offer counseling at the Children's Center. Every time we talk about, we tell someone about these services, the response is overwhelmingly positive, but people are still often surprised to learn that these services exist. Since January 2019, they've gone live. We've done a lot to get the word out, but clearly there's a lot more that can be done. JCCA and other providers can only help people if we, uh, we can only help if people know that we're here to support them. When New Yorkers access services at city agencies like we've been hearing today, DHS, HRA, ACS, it's because it's rather, um, sorry, it is because they are already in a moment of crisis and vulnerability. It's stressful. If we want them to be successful in finding economic, housing, or family stability, then we must support their mental health instead of only addressing it when they are at their breaking point. Education and training, all city employees about available services so they can help families access behavioral health care will help us fulfill our commitment to the well-being of all of our neighbors and communities. Lastly, I just want to help explain why these behavioral health supports are such an important investment in our young people. Some of you may be aware of the research surrounding adverse childhood experience, also referred to as ACE. This research shows that having three or more ACE 
uh, scores in the areas of things like divorce, domestic violence, parents who have a substance abuse issue, has long-term effects on adulthood. It increases heart disease, it lowers educational and professional achie achievement, um, higher rates of cancer, incarceration, the list goes on and on. That's why something as simple as a list of free or Medicaid-funded men mental health supports is just a step forward. Whether or not someone triumphs over their adverse childhood experience has a lot to do with the support they receive as they grow up. When we can support the resiliency of our young people, we are contributing to the success of our communities, we are exponentially reducing future health care costs, and we are keeping people out of prison, out of higher levels of care. This bill is just not a list. It represents our belief that all New Yorkers can make it here and anywhere when they have the resources that they deserve. I am grateful to the council member Torres for his commitment to our families, to their kids, um, and our kids by sponsoring this legislation. Big thanks to Chair Ayala and the committee members for your interest and assistance. Behavioral health services are effective, necessary, and many times life-saving. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for the support of the bill. I will be sure to let Council Member Torres know um, he had to take a call. But thank you for all of the services that you provide. I know that you guys are one of my favorites, um, and I that's for a reason. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you need to visit us, too. <laughs> Actually, this meeting has been adjourned. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So did you. They said the best for last. <laughs>